given are the coordinates. Uh, B, the entries B and then of a matrix B are just the relaxation rate, and the haters are uh, white noises with an arbitrary covariance matrix D. So in in matrix notations that we'll use throughout this uh, this presentation, uh, bold face letters denote vectors and matrices. So dx by dt is minus bx plus eta, and the covariance of eta is a matrix D. So the process is entirely defined by two matrices, which I will call the rate matrix and the diffusion matrix. They are positive and they are square n by n matrices. I only work in the finite dimensional case. They are positive in a slightly different sense. B, the, the, the rate matrix, it just has to describe the relaxation in the absence of noise. So in order for the origin to be stable, B just has to have eigenvalues whose real parts are positive. In general, B is not symmetric. It has no reason to be. So it has complex spectrum. But the real parts of its eigenvalues have to be strictly positive. D is a symmetric matrix because it's a covariance matrix. So I, it's positive. I assume that all its eigenvalues are positive. And these two conditions ensure that you have a good, a proper, a stationary state with Gaussian fluctuations. Yeah? This condition ensures that you relax to zero in the absence of noise, so you, you relax to a fluctuating steady state in the presence of noise. And this condition ensures that all channels are noisy. Yeah? If there are eigenvalues zero here, it means there are noiseless channels and it's a bit, it's a bit singular. So here are the hypotheses, and we have to deal with two n by n matrices. Okay. okay, so let's see how the dynamics works and the stationary state. You introduce the Green's function of the problem, e to the minus b times t, which allows you to write the time-dependent solution x of t in terms of the initial value act with the Green's function here, and a, an integral over the noises at all intermediate states, of course, with the same Green's function, because everything's linear. From there, you can derive the equal time correlation matrix. Uh, from now on, I only use matrix forms, so xx transpose, which is a square matrix, S of t, correlation or structure matrix. Well, there is a part depending on the initial state, and there is a part depending on the noise, which, has, which is quadratic in the Green's function each time. What's interesting to notice is that this structure matrix obeys a, itself uh, an evolution equation, which is deterministic and which has that form. ds by dt is 2d minus bs minus sbt. In the long time regime, the correlation matrix reaches a stationary value, which describes the unique stationary state of the problem, which has that form because in the long time regime, the initial state can be forgotten. The Green's function decays. So at stationarity, you just have a Gaussian probability density in these coordinates x, whose here in the weight, you have the reciprocal of this covariance matrix. So if you are interested in the stationary state, you just have to work out this correlation matrix. The simplest way of doing so is to notice that it obeys this equation, which is obtained by just equating the right-hand side of this evolution equation to zero. So the correlation matrix obeys this equation. It is linear, but it has this very special form. Bs plus Sbt is 2 times d. And this class of linear equations for matrices is referred to as Sylvester equations. So. The determination of the stationary state, or at least in the weights of configurations in the stationary state, boils down to solving this Sylvester equation. So let's go on and look first at a special situation which will turn out to be the equilibrium one. So I recall here the Sylvester equation for the stationary state. Bs plus Sbt is 2 times d. And I 
consider for the time being that question, can one have BS and SBT separately equal to D? This is clearly a particular case. The answer is yes. Well, you assume this and you plug it here. You have two expressions for S here. And so there is a compatibility equation, which, just, which is just that one. BD is DBT, which means that BD is symmetric. Because uh, B, well, D is already symmetric. Yeah? So the condition to have this separability in that sense is that BD is symmetric. And as it turns out, this is the condition for the dynamics to be reversible. It will become clear in a while. At that level, I don't give a formal proof of that, but this is true in full generality. For the time being, let's just, just assume it. So, if I have this condition, the dynamics is reversible, the corresponding stationary state is an equilibrium state, and it is just given by, well, this simple, rather simple expression. I solve BS equals D, or I solve SBT equals D, and I get this. And because of that relation, this is one, this is all the same. This is a single expression. So in this reversible case, finding the correlation matrix S just amounts to inverting the rate matrix. Nothing more. Uh, to have an idea of what is behind this compatibility condition, let me assume that the x's describe the coordinates of some oscillators coupled to a single bath with so identical and independent Langevin noises, since some units d is the identity. Then this condition gives that b is symmetric. And in that context of oscillator dynamics, then the symmetry of B just expresses action and reaction principle. So if you wish, this compatibility condition is a kind of extension to a more complicated situation with, if you wish, several temperatures or whatever, several sources of noise of this action and reaction principle. Yeah? Even though in the general case, there is no underlying Hamiltonian, uh, it's, it's, it's a very different picture of, of uh, non-equilibrium dynamics. So that is for the reversible case. And now what happens in the general case? So here is again the Sylvester equation. In the generic case where BD is not symmetric, then the dynamics is reversible. We'll see many manifestations of that in, in what follows. More into, well, from a technical viewpoint, solving the Sylvester equation, which is that one, is harder than a matrix inversion. To see that, I, it's interesting to consider the case where B is diagonalizable. I, I remember B is a real matrix, but it need not be a uh, Hermitian, so it doesn't have complex spectrum, so it can have degeneracies which make it non-diagonalizable. So if it is, that means that to each eigenvalue B sub K, possibly complex, there is a left and a right eigenvector which are denoted L sub K and R sub K. Then, formally, the solution of the Sylvester equation can be written as, as follows, which is a double spectral sum with, in the denominators, BK plus BL, and in the numerator, some matrix element. So, why is it harder than matrix inversion? Well, in a matrix inversion, you would have, the, the analogous expression will be a simple spectral sum. You would have the eigenvalues in the denominator. So if you put everyone to the same denominator, you have the product of the eigenvalues of B, namely the determinant of B. Here, you have all the sums, all the pairwise sums of two different eigenvalues of B. So this is a polynomial in the entries of B, of course, but with, with a much larger degree. The, the determinant of degree n has been replaced by something else, call it the bideterminant, even though the, it's not, the, the word bideterminant means something else, but which has degree growing like n squared. So in that sense, solving this Sylvester equation, in spite of its linearity, is much harder. But 
you still have a linear system, so you still have the advantage that only linear algebra is, is needed, yeah, for, for if you assume that you can, you can solve this. Yeah. Okay, so let me go on with the characterization of this non-equilibrium stationary state, and this will be the, the, the heart of the work and the heart of the talk. I start with very basic definitions, and then I will work out several characteristics of this non-equilibrium uh, steady state. So, to make progress, it's interesting to introduce the Onzaga matrix, which by definition is the product BS. The Onzaga matrix is the one which uh, occurs in linear response theory, in, in, quite, in quite generally. Here, the whole system is linear, so describing it at all or within a linear response is, is, is essentially the same. So, if I introduce this Onzaga matrix L and I put it equal to D plus Q, then it's transposed, which is SBT. I take SBT from here, it is D minus Q, which means that the Onzaga matrix has been decomposed into a symmetric part which in some units is just the, the diffusion matrix, and a skew-symmetric part, anti-symmetric in French, yeah, which measures the amount of irreversibility. Why? Because at equilibrium, you remember, BS and SBT are separately equal to D, so Q vanishes. So Q measures the amount of irreversibility in the system. Okay, that's probably the central point of the, of the construction. Yeah, I rem the data are B and D. You have to solve for S, for instance, by using this double spectral sum, and then you start the construction. It's interesting to bring this Q symmetric matrix Q in dimensionless and Hermitian form by stating Q is I, D1 half, H, D1 half. The advantage well, H, H has the same information content as Q, but it has two advantages. It is dimensionless and it is Hermitian. And uh, to sum up what will what will uh, follow soon, all the characteristics of this non-equilibrium stationary state will be expressed in terms of Q or equivalently in terms of H. So let me start with a few simple things. For instance, the probability current, you know, one characteristic of non-equilibrium stationary states is that they are permanent probability currents at the microscopic level. Uh, you know, to see whether a system is at equilibrium, you can say you, you record it and then you film, you, you, you look at the film backwards and you see events that you would not see in the forward evolution. And if you are not at equilibrium, the answer is yes. And at a microscopic level, it means you have stationary uh, probability currents running into your, your system. So here, the stationary probability current is easy to work out. For instance, you can use the Fokker-Planck uh, formalism. Then J of X, J is a vector and X is also a vector. It's proportional to P of X, that's clear. And here you have a vector there is no absolute vector, there is no fixed direction in your space, so this vector has to be x itself, the coordinates themselves, namely the distance from the origin, which is the, the fixed point. And here you have a tensor, a matrix or a tensor, which we call the mobility tensor. And if you work it out, you find this expression. So the mobility tensor, which measures the intensity of these probability currents, is, well, there is an S inverse here, and then it's proportional to Q. So it's our first example of a characteristic of non equilibrium which is proportional to Q, which is the, the, the skew symmetric part of the Onzaga matrix. Yeah, it measures the distance from equilibrium. Another in very important quantity, which will play a key role in the following, is the rate of entropy production per unit time at stationarity. Why do we uh, focus on this quantity? Because it is this the signature of irreversibility by excellence. Yeah. It is the quantity which occurs 
in various uh, deep theorems characterizing fluctuations and non-equilibrium stationary states, galavoti cohen and other fluctuations theorems. In full generality, they are formulated in terms of an entropy production rate. Even in systems which are not stochastic, if you have chaotic dynamical systems, you will have similar, similar phenomenon. So it's a central quantity in the theory of non-equilibrium systems. For systems like the one we are considering, namely diffusions, it is well known and well accepted that this entropy production rate is a quadratic form in the probability currents. Namely, it has that form. So the, the space integral just means a, an average, and it is quadratic in these permanent currents, which have been evalu evaluated here. Yes. So putting everything together, uh, of course, the, 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 the average can also be worked out because S is itself the matrix of correlations. So averaging a quantity is essentially contracting in the with, with S. So finally, we get phi, this entropy production rate per unit time for the whole system as being the trace of something which is quadratic in Q now. So quadratic in the distance to equilibrium or equivalently in terms of this dimensionless form, it is quadratic in H. Here it's even nicer because H appears in the square. So far so good for these general quantities. Now I switch to something with more variables. Correlation, response and fluctuation dissipation ratio. So, I start here with a reminder of what used usually to characterize lack of equilibrium, and I take one degree of freedom to be simple. So here, the framework is very general. It can be an aging system, uh, it can be a spin glass, it can be all these kinds of things which exhibit a slow dynamics, uh, need not be an unequilibrium stationary state. So there, it's usual to compare the correlation and the associated response for a given degree of freedom, x. So the correlation is sim simply, now these are two time quantities. The correlation is simply the, the, well, what it is, x of t, x of s, and the response is the variation of the mean of x of t with respect to the conjugate field at the earlier time. So to define this, you have an implicitly an underlying Hamiltonian formalism, or at least you know what is a conjugate field. Then, what is interesting to notice is that in out of equilibrium, usually response and correlations are not related by TR is DC DT, which you would be, which you would have at equilibrium. This is just standard fluctuation dissipation theorem, but in a quite a broad uh, set of circumstances, these two quantities are proportional to each other. The proportionality constant here, x of t and s, being referred to as the fluctuation dissipation ratio. This is a very general framework which has been used for now uh, 30 years, almost 30 years, to describe uh, non-equilibrium systems. Okay, so let's come back to our present model here. So here, I define the correlation matrix as just being xm of t, xn of s, where m and n are just two labels of my coordinates. I define the associated response by meaning d of the mean xm over the mean of the noise, because noise being additive, the notion of conjugate field is obvious here, it's the noise itself. Okay, so these quantities are defined in, the, in that natural way. And now, if I look at stationarity, which is the, the, the focus of this, this, at least of this talk, at stationarity, you have time translation or invariance. So, these quantities only depend on the difference in the, the two times, on the relative time, which is usually denoted by tau. And their dependence on tau is very simple. For the response, you propagate the noise, so the response is just the Green's function as a matrix. 
And for the correlations, it's almost as simple. It is just the Green's function at, at, the, at the corresponding time tau acting on the static uh, correlation matrix. So nothing can be simpler. But now, if you put the two together, trying to mimic what occurs in this general framework or trying to express this general framework, which is usually re referred to as the coriander lokorchan formalism, I forgot to, to, to tell it, then you get this expression. R of tau times d, d playing the role of temperature, is minus dc d tau, because tau is oriented in that way, times x. And as, as a result, here is here occurs a non-trivial constant matrix, which is so referred to as being the DFDR matrix of the problem. And what is this constant fluctuation dissipation ratio matrix here? You can work it out, you know everything. It is given by this. X inverse is again proportional to 1, one plus Q. Again, this measure of the distance to equilibrium or equivalently in dimensionless form proportional to h. Here it is manifest that, every, that everything is dimensionless. So this is one another of the key results of this, of this approach. Of course at equilibrium q vanishes so you get back x is equal to 1. You get the standard fluctuation dissipation uh, results. Of course, at stationarity, because we have focused to stationarity. Okay, so that's just what I say here. If the dynamics is reversible, then x is 1, which is expected at equilibrium. If the dynamics is irreversible, then x is not 1. It has complex eigenvalues, which are, because of this relation here, yeah, the spectrum of H is related to the spectrum of X. The eigenvalues are 1 over 1 plus I times H sub K, where the H sub K are the dimensionless eigenvalues of the, of the matrix H. So here is a plot of what happens. This is the X plane. These are the X's. X is 1 over 1 plus I times something real is the equation of a circle with diameter 0 and 1. The H sub K are the eigenvalues of H. H is Hermitian, but it's not a an arbitrary Hermitian matrix. It is I times the real skew symmetric matrix. So it obeys um, chiral symmetry, if you wish. The non-zero eigenvalues occur in op pairs of opposites, pairs of opposite numbers in H, so pair of complex conjugate numbers in, a, in X. And if dimension is odd, just as here, 7, there is one eigenvalue of h which vanishes, so one eigenvalue of x which is 1. So if you wish, if the dimension, if the number of degrees of freedom is odd, there is one channel which is at equilibrium by construction. Okay, here the blue symbol denotes the center of mass of all these eigenvalues. 1 over n trace of x. If you wish, it is the, the typical value of the fluctuation dissipation ratio. Yeah, if you assume that n is large and you take an observable which has more or less equal weight onto all these uh, channels, then the observed uh, value of the, F, of the fluctuation dissipation ratio at stationarity will be this, this, this typical value. Okay, to close the, this general part before going to examples, I'd like to briefly discuss what occurs in the two-dimensional case. So in two dimension, you have a B matrix and a D matrix, which is symmetric. So you have seven parameters, which is already a lot. There are quite a few examples in the literature of models which uh, are equivalent to our uh, einstein ulbeck model in two coordinates. And uh, some of these situations are reviewed in this very complete uh, review paper by uh, Christian Maas and collaborators. Uh, it's called Statistical Forces from Close to Equilibrium Media, 
Of course, for them, they look at situations which are close to equilibrium, they linearize in the distance to equilibrium, so in an effective way, they, 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 they are considering the same model. So, in the two by two case, when is the dynamics reversible? Well, I work out this condition, this compatibility condition, and I find, of course, it is Q-symmetric, I find a single coupling constant here. So in the two by two case, irreversibility is measured by a single quantity, this coupling constant uh, J, G, and it is bilinear, it has that form. It's linear in the entries of B and of D. Okay, and here, is a dense slide with a few useful formulas in that two by two case. It shows you that already in the two by two case uh, formulae are a bit uh, uh, heavy. They are, as I said, much more complicated than just inverting a matrix. In the two by two case, you, you see you see what the inverse of a two by two matrix here, and here you see the the, the, the correlation matrix of the model. So it's it's much more complicated. In particular, here you have this denominator of degree uh, three here, which is more complicated than matrix inversion. The irreversibility matrix Q, of course, it is Q symmetric, and it's proportional to this coupling constant G that I mentioned before, which measures irreversibility. If we work out the entropy production rate, we find, well, as expected, something which is quadratic in this quantity. And if we work out the FDR matrix, then it is also it is one plus something proportional to G. And if I work out the typical value of this FD ratio, I get one over one plus something which is quadratic in G. And in the special case n equal to, since there is only one constant which measures the distance to equilibrium, then quantities are in some sense related to each other in all possible ways. In particular, this typical value of the FD ratio is related to the entropy production rate in that very simple form. Yeah, you see that everything is dimensionless because this is a frequency, but this is also a frequency. And uh, this is a coincidence, well, this is a Peculiarity of the two-dimensional case, in the higher dimensional situation, uh, you don't have such a relation because there are several uh, eigenvalues of the matrix H which play a role in, in different ways into the different, in the different expressions. I guess this closes the general part. And now I will switch to an explicit example to show you that this formalism uh, is indeed uh, predictive and gives specific results in, uh, in concrete cases. So instead of taking a microscopic example, such as a, a spin chain with a non-equilibrium dynamics, uh, I have chosen to focus on these kind of systems. So these are macroscopic objects that you could, you could build in a, easily build in a lab. Here, these are resistively coupled RL electrical circuits. So you have N loops here. Each loop here, you have an inductance coil. All the coils are identical. And here, between the loops, you have resistors. All the resistors are identical. And what makes the problem non-trivial is that you have an inhomogeneous temperature profile, namely each resistor is kept at a different temperature. And that's what drives the system out of equilibrium. You notice that there is no uh, coupling to an external power generator. So it's not the standard picture of an non-equilibrium system, um, which is kept out of equilibrium because it is driven. Here there is no driving, except this temperature profile. So, how does temperature occur in the system? Well, I have to remind you the Nyquist theory of thermal noise. So, if I take resistor number N, it is a temperature Tn, so there is a voltage between its two endpoints, which is a white noise of that form. Uh, of course, they are decorrelated between uh, the different uh, resistors, so delta Mn, it's a white noise, and the amplitude of the noise is the resistance times the 
temperature at that point to RTN. Well, usually in the Nyquist theorem, you put 4 KTR, but uh, you only consider um, positive frequencies. So it's, it's, it's all the same. Then the natural coordinates to look at are the loop current intensities defined in this way. And they obey these differential equations, just standard equations for voltages. And here are the noises. And so we are facing an Einstein-Ullenbeck process of the kind we have studied with the rate matrix, which is just given by the, the Laplacian on the, on the chain with uh, matrix elements two on the diagonal and minus one on the two neighboring diagonals. It's a tri-diagonal matrix. And the diffusion constant of matrix D, which is in some units a temperature matrix, and the temperature matrix is constructed from the local temperatures according to specific rules. Okay, so if the temperature profile is homogeneous, all the TNs are equal to the same T, then the temperature matrix is also the, 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 the Laplacian. So B and D are proportional to each other, so they obey the compatibility condition, which, so you are at equilibrium as expected, and the correlation matrix is proportional to the identity, which means that all the loop currents are independent of each other and they, they are Gaussian distributed, but uh, with, no, with no correlations. So that's what, that's what occurs if temperature is homogeneous. Now let's look at occurs when the temperature is not homogeneous, starting with two loops to be simple. So three resistors. So here are the B and D matrices. And now the reversibility condition, condition to have equilibrium, if you work it out, it reads T0 equal T2. It doesn't involve T1. So what does it mean? It means that if you have only two loops here, the system is at equilibrium if the two extreme resistances are the same temperature, which can be different from the middle one. Well, this is a bit peculiar, admittedly, but this is due to a symmetry. If you have this condition, then the sum and the difference of the two loop currents, I1 and I2, are executing, as they say, two independent einstein ullenbeck processes, one-dimensional einstein ullenbeck processes, and these processes are at equilibrium. So it's a peculiarity which is easily understandable in terms of a symmetry. Okay, in the general case, the entropy production rate is proportional to T2 minus T0 squared, that the distance to equilibrium with some denominator, and the dependence on T1 is only very mild, it is only in some terms in the, in the denominator. So this is it, but what occurs with two loops. What occurs for larger systems? To see something, it's interesting to focus on the regime where the temperature profile is only weakly inhomogeneous, in the sense that the temperature T sub n is some reference T bar plus a small fluctuation. So the profile, the temperature profile varies over a small range around the mean value. Then the entropy production rate is a quadratic form in, uh, in these temperature variations. Uh, what else? So phi in some units, it's a quadratic form in these temperature differences, where omega here is a symmetric matrix. It is of size n plus 1 times n plus 1, n plus 1 being the number of resistors, so the number of different uh, temperature variables. And the symmetric matrix is known, known meaning that Claude and me have been able to determine it explicitly in all system sizes in terms of discrete uh, Fourier sums. So here are a few examples. If n is 2, I re we have this matrix, which is just a transcription of this uh, numerator here, no T1. So it has accordingly an explicit zero mode here. 
If n is 3, we get a large uh, matrix here with integer, well, rational uh, coefficients. And this is already the generic situation. This, is a, this matrix has already a full, full rank. Yeah? Okay. In order to see more, especially on the size dependence, it's, it's interesting to further simplify the problem and to further uh, specialize it to the case that we can call a, weak, a quench random temperature profile, namely these temperature variations are small and they are independent from one another. Name and they have a width which is the same for all of them. Yeah, so you see, T is T bar plus delta T n, and these delta T n's are small random variables which are quenched, namely fixed once for all. The temperature profile over the system is fixed once for all. And if you look at this regime, then the mean entropy production rate is in some units, which is of course proportional to W square, just proportional to the trace of this matrix omega, which occurred uh, here previously. Yeah. So the interesting dependence to be predicted is the dependence on the remaining parameter, which is the number of elementary circuits, the system size n, and it, the n dependence is only in this trace omega. So this can be worked out for n equal two, you get one sixth, n equal three, n equal four, and so on. And in the large n limit, trace of omega is found to increase linearly in n with a prefactor, which is uh, what it is. Now it's not a rational number. Yeah, I told you these are the, the, the matrix entries of omega are evaluated as they occur as Fourier sums. So Fourier sums for large systems, they become Fourier integrals, and that explains the, the occurrence of number pi here. So here, this number represents the entropy production rate per unit time and unit length in this peculiar regime of a, a weak, uh, weak random temperature profile. So this is all for these RL networks, and in the remaining time, yeah, I still have some Time to work out a different geometry. Well, the same geometry with a, a different electrical circuit. Now, we still consider resistive couplings with an inhomogeneous temperature profile, but the, 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 the horizontal bonds are capacitors now, instead of being inductances. Okay, now the uh, correct degrees of freedom which obey uh, reasonable uh, differential equations are the charges on the right electrode. So Q1 is the primitive of I1 from the initial time to time t. It is the charge on the right electrode up here. These charges Q sub n, they obey differential equations which are similar to those uh, of the previous example with a difference that now d by dt is in the right hand side. Yeah. Let me flash the previous, the previous differential equations were here. There was a second difference here, but the d by dt was on the left hand side. Now, both the double difference, both the double difference, the second difference and the d by dt are on the same side. Okay. Nevertheless, this is a, still a einstein ullenbeck process of the kind we, we are interested in, but the rate matrix now is the reciprocal of the graph Laplacian, delta inverse, and the diffusion matrix D contains the same temperature matrix as before, but times twice the reciprocal of this graph Laplacian. That's the main difference between the two uh, situations. Okay, at equilibrium, uh, if you have a homogeneous temperature, the temperature matrix T is still proportional to the graph Laplacian, so things cancel out. B and D are again proportional to each other, and so the correlation matrix is again proportional to identity, which means that all these charges of the various capacitances here 
they are Gaussian independent and have a very simple variance uh, T times C in some units. Okay, what happens if the temperature profile is inhomogeneous? Well, the situation is very similar to the previous case. Let's look first at what occurs for two loops. Uh, the reversibility condition is the same as before, T0 equal T2, so same comments. T1 is not involved. Whenever you have this situation, you have again a decoupling of the system into two independent one-dimensional systems. It's again very peculiar, explainable in terms of symmetry, and the entropy production rate accordingly involves only T2 minus T0 squared. Now, uh, the same simplification occurs if the temperature inhomogeneities are small. The entropy production rate is again quadratic in these uh, variables. Uh, this quadratic form is defined by a matrix, which I now denote by capital omega. It's again known in the previous uh, sense. We can express it in terms of discrete Fourier sums. And so here is the result for two loops. Again, you have an explicit zero mode here. And starting at three loops, you have you already have here the generic pattern. The, the signs are a bit different from the previous case. Uh, but OK, these are uh, details. If I further specialize to what I call quench random temperature profile, namely these the temperature variables to be uh, to be small and uh, considered as random, fixed once for all. Then the mean entropy production rate is again in some units given by this W square and by trace of this matrix omega, which carries the, the dependence on the system size. If n is two, uh, you can work out the trace here. Yeah, it's two over thirty-six. 1 over 18, 17 over 56, and so on. And you can also work out the asymptotic behavior of this uh, coefficient here for large n. And now, at variance with the previous case, you find the universal growth in n squared, the quadratic law with a simple coefficient uh, here, 1 over 6. And you have logarithmic corrections. So why this quadratic law? Well, the remark is that now this number, one sixth, is harder to interpret because you do not have extensivity. Yeah? In the previous case, RL networks, you remember, you had an entropy production rate per unit length. Now the global entropy production rate of the, of the array grows quadratically in that. So, there is no extensivity. So how can it be understood that the system, which is perfectly dull and uncorrelated in the case of a homogeneous temperature, just violates extensivity as soon as the temperature profile is not homogeneous? Well, one way, one simple way to, to, to understand it, or at least to remember it, consists in looking here again at the expression of the rate matrix. It is in some units proportional to the inverse of the graph Laplacian. But in one dimension, the, in, the, the, element, the matrix elements of this delta inverse grow linearly in the bulk of the system. They, they grow like the, the distance or like, like this, linearly with, the, with the, the spatial coordinates. Why? Because think of a continuum Laplacian it, here you will have dq over q squared in one dimension. So you have a linear divergency. And this linear divergency means that for the graph Laplacian, the matrix elements here grow linearly with separations. And so if you, this is not a proof, this is just an argument. If you evaluate a global quantity such as that one, well then with this setting, you are not surprised to find something which violates extensivity. So here it's, here it's quadratic. 
and in the algorithm, algorithmic correction, it's a, they have a whole story in themselves, they can be worked out, the finite part can even be, be worked out. Okay, I think I have finished with these electrical arrays. So now we'll uh, just have a one page uh, summary of this talk. It's a take home message, or a keep home rather, because I guess most of you are already at home. So, multivariate Einstein Nullenbeck processes are remarkable in several respects. I hope to have convinced you that they have some some general interest. First, they are fairly uh, ubiquitous because they just describe linear relaxation of more than one degree of freedom with additive noise. The, the, the linear relaxation can just be obtained by thinking you are linearizing around the stable fixed point, more complicated nonlinear system. Their main interest is that their analysis only involves linear algebra. No field theory needed here, in, at least in the finite dimensional case. Their dynamics is generically irreversible. And so this dynamics drives the system to the simplest of all non-equilibrium stationary states, which can be described precisely by means of this linear algebra. The key step is consists in solving this Sylvester equation. And I have shown you in detail that it is more complicated than what we are used to, namely than matrix inversion. All characteristics of the non-equilibrium stationary state can be worked out, and a few of them have been worked out here, in, in terms of the skew symmetric Q, which is just the skew symmetric part of the Onzaga matrix, or H in dimensionless form. And I have shown you a few explicit results in the concrete situation of, of electrical arrays. Okay, and again, this is uh, inspired from that work by Claude Godrech and myself published two, two years ago. Okay, I'm on time. And I thank you for your, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Marc. Thanks for the nice talk. Other questions? I have a question. If, uh, Please go. Can you hear me? Yes. Ah, can you hear me, Jean-Marc? Salut. Uh, yes, yes. Um, so, uh, a question with respect to the this um, non-extensivity of the uh, entropy production. I was wondering whether uh, this is, um, if you compare with other non-equilibrium stationary state, uh, you would say this is a peculiar result. Uh, is it is it is it understood uh, whether the scaling uh, usually is linear or? Uh, for, for linear, let's say linear system with, with multiple kind of uh, driving, is there no zoology of this scaling with entropy production with, with number of degrees of freedom? Well, in a generic situation with a finite correlation length, then I would expect that extensivity is recovered just as any, any, any uh, thermodynamic uh, quantity. Okay. Uh, to put it the other way around, uh, such violations of extensivity could be uh, expected if you are at a special point in your system, for instance, at a critical point. Okay. I don't remember the analog for, for spin chains. We have also a few examples where we've worked this out, but I would not be, I would not be surprised if that at criticality, you would have uh, also anomalous scaling for these, these global quantities. Here you have seen the, the 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 origin of the problem is rather clear, yeah. Oh, you yeah. you, you yeah, understood yeah. by my argument, yeah. yeah, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. The, even in the absence of noise, the this rate matrix has large uh, has it's large entries matrix. because of the geometry. Mm -hmm. So you would expect something like that in an RC circuit, even 
with different kind of driving, not in homogeneous temperature, let's say, but uh, I don't know, boundary driving, is it something that... Uh, exactly. If you ask okay. other okay. questions, you will also be sensitive to this uh, okay. amplification okay. due to... Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, thanks. That's what I guess. J'ai une question, Jean-Marc, Bertrand. Euh, tu oui. as mentionné Gadavotic Cohen dans ton exposé, et puis ils ne sont pas réapparus ensuite. Euh, non. Ils apparaissaient dans vos calculs, j'imagine. Non, euh, parce que ici, or oh, maybe I should say it in English, I don't know, for everyone to... OK. <laughs> Here, uh, we are in a linear framework, so... Uh, where... Uh, where we just use the entropy uh, production rate as being a prototypical quantity, which is quadratic in this current and which is so easy to evaluate. And then we use it because it's a prototypical quantity, uh, which is dimensionless, but well, it has a frequency, but it is positive. It's simple to deal with. It's rather simple to, to, to evaluate with respect to other quantities. But uh, here we are in a very simple linear setting, so we have nothing to tell about, uh, we have nothing to add to, to about the general properties such as these fluctuation theorems. Here, well, they are just obeyed by, uh, essentially by construction. You have seen a few examples. The quantities have the, the structure which is expected from general theory, and moreover, they have simple expressions in terms of these uh, uh, matrices Q and H. Yeah, you, you could you could ask the you could ask the same question for the uh, FD ratio. In general, it's complicated to evaluate. It still depends on times, at stationarity, and so on. Here, it is simple. It is constant, and you know what it is. So that's we we, ha we have nothing extra to 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 say about the general, the, about the general case. Uh, hi, uh, I have a, a question uh, with uh, personal bias on, on the question. So I, I was puzzled by Alvin of your talk the, uh, the, on the RC and RL uh, circuits. You, you, you characterize things in terms of your matrices uh, omega, which have uh, uh, rational coefficients. So I was wondering, if, so you said that these, uh, these coefficients can be computed by uh, Fourier sums. I was wondering if you also had a combinatorial interpretation for these. Uh, these ah, yes, I understand your, your interest. Uh, the answer is, I don't know. Uh, maybe, could be. Uh, it would even be more, it would even be more interesting. Uh, Already the signs of these coefficients is not entirely obvious. Well, there is one of the two situations, but of course I do not remember who is who now. There is one of the two cases where the sign pattern is already of interest. This, this, this will maybe rise your, your, your interest. Uh, <laughs> in one of the two situations, I don't remember which one, the, the region where this uh, metric entries are positive, say, mm -hmm. occur in two symmetric uh, kind of oval regions here, which are vaguely reminiscent of Arctic circles. Oh. You see. Yeah, of course, cool. here nothing is here. There is no Arctic uh, phenomenon. Nothing is frozen. It's just a change of sign. But it's already amazing that this this matrix. Uh, has the, the, the entries have given signs in two uh, strange oval regions here and there. Mm -hmm. I see. That's, that's, that's the only observation I have, in, which is vaguely vaguely related to, to, to some other interpretation. But of course, yeah, it would be interesting to find them a, an interpretation. Yeah. If I may, um, Jean-Marc, it's Kiron. Kiran, oui, je yeah. sais. In fact, I had a very similar question uh, as Jeremy and probably Sanjay. So I tried to put uh, the denominators you found, these uh, 36, 224, or 115, 2, 323, and so on, in the integral sequence, uh, of, ah, uh, you know? Yeah. Unfor unfortunately, he doesn't seem to know them. Okay. All these okay. numbers, 18, 56, uh, 
Uh, I think yeah. yes. I think we, tr- I think, yeah, our, we also tried. I imagine so. Yeah. Uh, I don't remember precisely, but I guess we also tried, and uh, maybe with some effort we could reduce at least the denominators to something more perfect, to something simpler. Uh, Okay, I had a, a more physical question, maybe. Um, so, of course, here the prefactor is n square, but you have a, a subleading term which is n log n. Yes. Is there anything kind of universal which could you could uh, extract from these things, or more general than linear systems? Uh, suppose that uh, you're near stationarity, you can linearize or whatever. Or... I don't. I don't know. I I, I could not tell you. Uh, this one sixth is is rather appealing, but it's probably rather easy to 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 guess as well. In the in the in the other case, uh, the extensive part, yeah, where you have extensivity, this number is, as you see, uh, non-universal uh, lattice dependent. Uh, mm. So here again. I, Yes, I, I don't know whether more universal numbers could, 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 uh, could be extracted. Uh, we, did not, we did not think of that. We have another class of examples, namely spin chains with exotic dynamics. Uh, maybe just comparing the two situations could already lead some uh, information in, in that direction. So, so far, I don't know. Mm. Thank you. Questions. Actually, I have one that is uh, thinking. Uh, so, in your process, can you, for example, add a bit of dynamics in the bees? So, you have a matrix B that you fix, but uh, imagine that you keep the, the, the dynamics still linear. In, in the variables, but now you give some independent dynamics on the bees, or for example, you add some kind of periodic term. Uh, I mean, I imagine that if, if you add some periodic term, you have some kind of dynamics in the floquet, some kind of floquet basis or things like that. But imagine that you have like uh, a B, a matrix B that has some time translation invariant dynamics uh, such that it's not constant. Do you think that you can generalize the Sylvester uh, equation and things like that? No. Uh, we did not think of that. Uh, in principle, even if B depends on time, the problem is still linear. Uh, of course, then uh, it's, it's a lot more complicated because the, the, the Sylvester equation will keep some time dependence. You mentioned the Floquet uh, theory. Maybe the first, first possible extension would be to take the same Sylvester equation with B now be periodic in time. And you look at S uh, having the same periodicity. Yeah. Uh, no, we, we did not think of that, but uh, could, be, uh, could possibly be of interest. OK. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Are there other questions? Okay, so maybe if not, we can stop here. Thanks a lot, Jean Marc. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. And see you next time. Okay. Bye. Okay, bye bye to everybody. Bye. Bye bye. Well...